Welcome to the Power of Culture. I'm Al Mayasa bin Hamad bin Khalifa Al Thani. My nation, Qatar, is on a creative journey supporting the talents of a rising generation, reaching out to other countries through the arts and building an entire cultural infrastructure. In each episode of The Power of Culture, I'm joined by a leading artist or architect, philanthropist or museum professional who is part of Qatar's journey. Listen in as we discuss what the power of culture can do. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Qatari American artist, writer, and filmmaker, Sofia El Maria. Good morning, Sofia. How are you? I'm doing really well. I'm really happy to have this chat. I remember Robert De Niro handing you the first uh, award of the film you made. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? That was one of the more surreal moments in my life and definitely a highlight. I think that the Doha Film Institute really sort of kickstarted my career in film. As you know, I now write uh, for film and television. And that was the beginning in many ways. I'd always wanted to do film and then meeting a hero of mine who I used to have posters of Raging Bull on my wall. And actually meeting him in person was, yeah, a special and strange life moment. I know, I remember when I saw your film. Uh, talk a little bit about the short film that you did before winning the award. It was quite, it was very, very powerful. It was a very simple idea, but very, very strong. Um, what inspired you to, to talk about that subject? Well, the film was called The Racer, and it was a sort of mixture of documentary footage that I had just shot with my younger siblings and found footage from online. So it was indeed an extremely simple premise. And it was written in the POV of a child who was a big fan of a, of a racer, a car racer who had crashed. And so it was a sort of, I guess, also an allegory about speed and acceleration, which is something that I felt was really important to think about, especially at that time in like the early sort of 2000s in the Gulf. Um, but just before you started making films, I recall that you started working as a researcher at Madhav's library. Mm. Is that correct? Yeah. That was another really um, formative period for me. I left university. I'd gone to university in Cairo and then went to Goldsmiths in the UK. And I came back to Doha to work. And the job was really special because it was essentially archiving a library that had been collected by... Sheikh Hassan over the years, and it was art books. And I think I really credit that with being a huge part of my art education, um, was being in that library, documenting what was there, also understanding what was happening regionally, um, because it was a really like second to none sort of catalog of catalogs, among other things. It was such a formative experience also because I got to meet a lot of the artists from the older generation, especially the Qatari artists, and interview them and get to know all of them and understand their work and what sort of sparked their sort of pioneering of art, of I guess sort of contemporary art in the region. Um, and without that education, I think the sort of Western focus of, I guess, my education previously in regards to art would have been, it would have been incomplete. So I'm very grateful for that experience. And you, um, you've also written a book, The Girl Who Fell to Earth. I, I recently saw, I think it was the New York Times, an article that says the five books you must read before going to Qatar. And one of them is yours, The Girl no Who Fell to Earth. <laughs> and I also remember um, a while ago when Meryl Streep was visiting Qatar, she had re read your book. And she told me she's, you're one of the best uh, writers she's, she's ever read. Um, <laughs> and that's, you wrote this book like 10 years ago. So what inspired you to write that memoir so early in your career? I'm very flattered by that um, information. And I didn't know that there was this article either, but that's exciting. I really wrote the book for the 13-year-old, 12-year-old me, um, for anybody who sort of struggled with having to be uh, on the threshold between different cultures and between different families. And it's something that people from all over the world have come and spoken to me about as being relevant and uh, an important book for them. And that's been the great gift of it and the inspiration for it. I wanted to tell a story about about love and about family and about the similarities between culture, two cultures, specifically the United States and, and the Gulf and specifically Qatar. And um, rather than sort of highlighting the differences, which tends to be 
the eternal sort of story in most media and with as much sensitivity and care as I would have wanted to have read when I was younger because most of the books that I had access to back then didn't sort of speak from a place of in between. And I think that there is an entire generation, many generations now, who have to sort of navigate this, um, whether it's cultural or um, there are so many different ways in which people have to straddle their lives and separate different parts of their lives. And I wanted to write something for those people. You're talking about having an, an American mother and a Qatari father mm. um, and also living you know, in the U.S. and then moving to Qatar, correct? Yeah. I left the United States when I was 16 and haven't lived there again since, but I had shuttled back and forth between as a child. And I think that's very common, um, or I know it's very common now, um, from all the various people who've come to speak with me about it. Uh, do you think, uh, having lived in two very different countries and experienced different um, communities, do you think that inspired or influenced the trajectory of your life in terms of what you're doing now? I mean, you're an artist, you're a filmmaker, you're a writer, you're, you're, you just wrote your, theater, your children's theater. Um, do you think this diversity um, allowed for that? I think it's all about perspective and the great sort of privilege of having live in different, sort of essentially like wear different masks or you know, present in different ways is that you witness both the differences and the similarities in a way that is very, like, again, very intimate and very um, human. And I think that that sensitivity that arises from having to do that all the time does sort of lend one to uh, the sensitivities that are traditionally sort of thought of as the things that spark an artistic heart, I guess, for lack of a better way of putting it. And you're working now also on Gulf futurism. What's all that about? I know you showed you showed a few works here already of different group exhibitions that we have done. But what again? Why did you choose to discuss the Gulf futurism? It's a really good question. It's one that came up recently that I feel like I have a slightly different perspective on. Um, because when when I first sort of coined that term with my collaborator Fatma Al Qadiri, who's a composer who now works in film. Um, in in Hollywood, she and I were talking and thinking a lot around how these like you know massive sort of and really ambitious and oftentimes like futuristic feeling projects in the region. Fatma's Kuwaiti. We met in Dubai. We sort of had we were just thinking around how much everything was changing since we were growing up in in high school, for example. In an attempt to sort of describe that, we came upon this idea of like Gulf futurism, but it's often been, it's, it started to be written about in press, like in Vice magazine and in Dazed and Confused and stuff. And it was very much hinged on an aesthetic of sort of like architectural fly throughs and, you know, huge skyscrapers and stuff. And that wasn't really what either of us were interested in talking about. It was more about the effect on society, the effect on, on the land, very much also concerned with environmentalism. And unlike something like Afrofuturism, for example, which is about writing a group of people who have been erased from the future in science fiction and fantasy, um, Gulf Futurism was much more of a critical term to think about what was happening right now. Um, in a region rather than like, for example, Afrofuturism is a sort of project for black people to like under to like write themselves into a future where they've been erased historically in the media. So I am still, I've like started revisiting the concept recently because again, that concept is about 10 years old when we first started thinking and writing about it and making work in that sort of genre. Um, and since then, there's a lot of younger artists who and also like colleagues and like artists also of my generation who also make work within that milieu from all over the Gulf. Um, so I'm really proud of it in that sense because it's been like a sort of gathering point to meet others who are interested in similar things. Is, is, um, is Fatima Munira's sister? Yeah. Uh, we just installed a work of hers at the West Bay New Beach. I heard. Yeah, I'm really sorry that I missed Munira, but she is a genius. Both of them are. The entire Qadiri clan, 
and their mother, <laughs> who's also an amazing artist. And Fatma just collaborated with you on your solo exhibition at Madhav, correct? Yes. You want to talk a little bit about Madhav's exhibition and why it was so important for you to have this uh, 10 years after you worked at Madhav, but also during the FIFA World Cup, our, our most uh, historic occasion to date? Yes. I cannot express enough how shook I am about this um, exhibition. I, like when, I, when it first was sort of proposed, I was extremely excited about this sort of prodigal return to the museum that I helped to open um, all those years ago. And it's a space that's very, it feels like it was such a labor of love for everyone who was working on the opening. And there are still several staff members who still work there. One of the art handlers, Haris, is also in one of the pieces. Um, and he's been there since even before I was there. Um, Elodie, the conservator. And so it felt like returning to a sort of family group, um, which was really a unique experience because I think I've worked in museums all over the world. And there's no place else that I would have had the opportunity to make work in the way that I did in, for example, the Whitney or the Tate Britain or any of these places. And that was really special. And to have it during the World Cup is also something that I thought a lot about in terms of contextualizing it. So there are works which directly reference the World Cup. There's a video piece uh, which I made on the night that it was announced we, we won the bid. And the jubilation in the streets was really like nothing I had ever experienced in in Doha, but also anywhere in the world. Everybody was out. I even ran into like my my family like as they were driving by and they're briefly like in the video. And that I feel like is a really important work because it documents that really brief moment, those few hours after it was announced and what that what that looked like on the eyes of the people who live in Doha from the busloads of people who were you know, coming home from work to the kids who are out like spraying silly string and wearing masks and, you know, jumping around. So it was really, yeah, it was that, that piece in particular I'm really happy about. You know, I love your title, Invisible Labor Day Dream Therapy. How did you come up with such a title? And um, I mean, I, we were at the opening of the exhibition. It's really a lot of content and great footage of past moments, such as when Qatar won the bid, but also the, you know, you working at Madhaf or seeing seeing the other works of other artists who who started at Madhaf as well or be, are part of Madhaf's collection. Mm. So how did you come up with such a title? It's, it's, you also have like a line drawn <laughs> across the title itself. Like, where did that come from? I'm really glad that you asked that because it's um, it is an opportunity to make the invisible visible in in the show itself and actually throughout all of my work and all of my shows I I like to bring the things that usually aren't present in the sort of highly pristine and preened gallery space or museum space and um, put them in the front and in this show. First of all, the title, Invisible Labors, which is crossed out, and then Daydream Therapy, which is written in handwriting, comes from two things. One, Daydream Therapy is the title of a work. It's a short film from the 1970s by Bernard Nicholas, and that film really, really moved me when I first saw it. As a screenwriter, I always write films, and I've often written films that are sort of genre, and often like they have a sort of like the little guy winning or the sort of Revengers tragedy kind of a feel. And that film is about a hotel worker um, in the United States. And she's so compelling. It ends with this incredible, really, really incredible song. And I um, asked Bernard and the UCLA Film Archive for permission to include it as a sort of contextualizing piece in the show. Then I, un I used that idea of daydream therapy to make workshops with various people who I encountered in Doha from all different sort of walks of life and many different languages, and then did daydream therapy workshops with each of them. Because I do believe that if you write down what you dream of, and I've experienced this in my own life, if you even just, yeah, if you spend time taking your dreams seriously, then they, they will begin to appear. And that's the sort of I guess one of the really magical and incredible things about Doha is that I have found that it is a place where 
really impossible things have been possible for me and for many, many people who go there. It's, it has something about it which is the, the time and the space in a way that is really special. So interesting that you say that because I was just at the, the Salam celebrations of 70 years since its creation and there were the, the grandchildren were taking me around and talking about the history of their grandfather who came here to work in the oil uh, pipes hmm. and then became a, met an Armenian person who was also working on the oil and learned photography. And then he opened his photography studio. And now they're one of the biggest companies uh, in Qatar for, re, you know, for retail and the luxury brands. So it, I was saying to them, this is really the Qatari dream. It's like people can come here and create their futures. And I, I am hoping that we can, we are doing the same in the cultural sector, whether it's in fashion, in food, in music, in art, in um, all the various disciplines um, that we've, we've chosen to embrace. Especially with education also. I mean, I wouldn't have had the ex education that I had if I hadn't been in Doha and graduated in Doha. It's just, it's people come from all over the world to go to the universities and stuff. It's extremely unique, I think. Yeah, I think also the, the when talking about education, the quality of education here um, that's being offered to all nationalities who live here is very high. And you're right. I mean, the diversity in the classrooms, the... The opportunities outside the classrooms in all areas, whether it's sports, whether it's culture, whether it's business, entrepreneurship, it's there's a lot to do here for children and there's there's no stress on children at the same time, which is quite unique to have the ability for children to, you know, live in a very safe Qatar is the safest country in the world, so they live in a very safe environment. There's not that stress and competition that you find in other places. Uh, yet it's uh, the quality of life overall is very high. So it's um, it's quite for me, anyways. It's uh, who have children. It's quite a, a unique place to bring up your children. But I want to go back to your exhibition and how, as an artist, you go about choosing your curators. You chose Amal al Hajj and Abdul al Rahman al Kibesi as your curators um, for this exhibition. How do you choose your curators? Because I'm assuming for each exhibition that you do, you're choosing different curators. Well, this was actually sort of unique in that I had a desire to learn more around, specifically around the subjects of, of like labor. Uh, and Amal specializes in, especially like, she had done a lot of work around various like artists from East Africa. I believe that she was working also with QM um, on this subject in regards to artists to work with. And I've for a long time and continue to be really interested and wanting to learn more about the histories of movement in the region. And in particular, the Binj al Mood House in Doha is something that I think is a really, again, unique museum in the world. I had been to the Slavery Museum in South Africa And then I went to that one um, before it was open and met uh, the team there. And I was so impressed and um, moved by a lot of the information that was in the museum that I had never known before. And so it was a subject that it, it remains a tricky one to navigate anywhere in the world. <laughs> um, and it's something that was just... Really, I wanted to under I wanted to have the opportunity to learn more about over the course of making this show, and while the show doesn't hinge directly on that because it's very much about my you know sort of like my entry point and about the museum and about art and artists who work within spaces who aren't considered artists and making them visible, there is still this like any any project that I do. I want to do it because it means that I can learn something about a subject. For example, any script that I write, and usually it's historical fiction, I always choose based on why is this time period interesting now or why is this subject relevant now and what can I learn? I want to time travel. I want to understand different perspectives. I want to be curious and remain curious. And so Amel's wealth of knowledge really uh, was the reason that I wanted to work with her specifically. Oftentimes in other contexts, you don't get to choose your cur curator. The curator chooses you, which is always an honor. But in this case, it was a bit reversed. So 
uh, that I think segues nicely into into your exhibitions that you've done before Matraf. I mean, you did you sh- you installed your work Scout at the Guangzhou Biennale, and later here at our Here There exhibition um, when we celebrated Qatarian Brazilian artists back in 2014. Mm. Um, and I know that you reinstalled it here at the Matthaf exhibition. So who's Scouts and why Scouts? What, what were you trying to do with this artwork? Well, the expanded version is in the show in Matthaf. So it's Scouts, plural. It's many of them all stacked together. The original Scout that was in Guangzhou was my first sculpture. I've since done various public sculptures, which is a great joy to have the public interacting with art. But that piece in particular was very much inspired by the massive sort of engineering feat that is land reclamation. And I had become very interested in these objects, the dolos, that even like Defna is built on these sorts of structures that are really brilliant sort of uh, geometrical shapes in cast in cement that, of course... I'm sure the audience will be familiar with these breakers. And I was thinking about using them as a sort of symbolic tool to think about what it means to reclaim the future, which feels like it's receding, and especially in relation to climate change and in relation to environmental tipping points and what that means for thinking around um, what a future could be. And... So essentially, they're sort of like meditative objects. They're they're lit from the inside. They have audio sort of inside of them. The original one had a little clip from the golden record that Carl Sagan sent into space, but it's the Arabic um, segment in it. It says, تَحَيَاتْنَا لِلْأَصْدِقَى فِي najum. It's that optimistic hope that I feel like in the 21st century has been sort of like fizzling slightly that I was calling back to in that original work. And so having them present and having many of them all stacked together, finally like sort of fulfilling this purpose of like building a, uh, a barricade or something to stand on was a really special opportunity because it's not very often that I, get to, that I get to realize some of these like larger scale sculptural objects. But it's, it's coming off the back of like a, a very wild year of installations. The Venice Biennale um, is coming down this week. And that was, again, like a much larger scale experience of putting together wall-based works for the first time, which again, we're dealing with huge historical subjects. And and so, yeah, I'm very both future and historically focused at the same time at all times. Yeah, I, I saw your uh, Venice uh, Biennale installation at the v uh, space. I really, it was really great. I really loved uh, watching it. I sat there, watched it twice. It was uh, very well done. So congratulations on that. Thank you. I'm honored. <laughs> Would you say that, you know, you've also worked like with Peter Weber on film scripts and he was one of the filmmakers who established, uh, you know, a lot of films for us here in Qatar. Um, and I know probably that's how you met and started to work for him and you have so many uh, different artistic disciplines that you're working on or in. How do you do this? And what kind of advice would you give listeners of artists either living in Qatar or are Qatari artists who want to present Qatar artistically on an international platform like yourself? And, um, you know, what advice do you give them? What kind of disappointments did you also experience? It's not always a successful journey all the time. Tell us a little bit more about about that. It's definitely not always a successful journey. And there is I've become battle worn working in a variety of disciplines. I think the advice that I can give is to be as true and honest with yourself about the work and about your whether you are taking joy and experiencing joy in the making of it because the moment that things become a drudgery yeah one's motives start to shift and i really especially with the film and television writing it's i get so much pleasure from learning about yeah about history 
And that itself feeds my artistic practice. And that's why having the two sort of completely separate worlds really suits me, which is maybe linked back to the, the original question about, you know, sort of living in between different cultures and families. So maybe that's why I'm more comfortable having two. But I always, they, they inform each other. So if I'm learning about, for example, medieval Scotland, it ends up in some way like in a, in a video piece, like Boudicca appears, um, the sort of Pictish queen appears in the Venice piece, which also has a lot of references to Qatar, and it opens with a baby camel that I shot in Doha years ago. And the advice I have is really just to be honest with yourself and your audience. And um, I know you've established very close relationships with some key curators who work globally how do you think that has helped evolve your work? Um, but also how, you know, why do you think this is really important for artists to develop relationships with curators from different parts of the world? Well, curators in, in many ways, I feel are the, it's, I don't know why this image of like water is coming to mind, but it feels like the stream of like conversation globally really happens in these not necessarily like formal events like talks or whatever, you know, I don't think that that's where interesting conversation and interesting ideas sort of like emerge. And over the years, I've been very lucky to become friends with various curators who absolutely have influenced my opportunities and career. And I think there is always this question of like, what exactly do curators do? <laughs> And for me, it is very much about like holding the space for artists, supporting artists. Um, it's, a, it's hugely different depending on who you're working with, how the work evolves. Because if you have a good curator who understands your process, then the work blossoms in ways that it doesn't if you're just sort of out flailing on your own, they'll ask, you know, I've had a curator ask me like a very directed question at the right moment. And then it just like opens up this whole other part of something that I never would have like thought of before. So it's very special. It's a special relationship, I feel, between the artist and the curator. And, and it's quite rare to find a working relationship that's just, you know, chef's kiss. It works. It, and, you know, I'm still looking for, for, for the perfect match, but I'm very, very happy with most of the people that I work with. It's really interesting that you describe it as such because one of the things that we have been trying to do as Qatar museums in Qatar but also you know indirectly region-wide is to showcase that museums exhibitions working with artists is not just about entertainment it's really about education it's about creating knowledge content there's a lot of research uh, behind our exhibitions. You know very well how long it takes to prepare an exhibition. Mm. And so you're right in engaging with curators that inspires a new conversation, new reflections, thoughts of when, of what an artist can do and communicate to the visitors that are coming through, whether they're families or children, other artists, visitors. You know, Qatar is a big cultural destination and a family destination now so it's very interesting how you describe that and that reminds me about when I saw your work at the Whitney Museum in New York I think that was the first exhibition you did internationally if I'm not mistaken it was the first solo show that I did internationally yeah I'd shown in New York before at the new museum but yeah that was the first and also the last show that I did in the U.S. Um, although hopefully I have one coming up next year, which I'm quite excited about. Yeah, and the Whitney Museum care about showing American artists. So I guess they consider you as an American artist, not just a Qatari artist, obviously because of your dual nationality. But um, I remember when I saw that work, it was it, in the space, it, it had a new life. And I think that's why it's so important for collections to travel and exhibitions to travel, because... In every space, it creates a new language, a new dialogue. And I, I really liked your work installed there in that it was a small space, but it was very powerful. Were you satisfied with your exhibit there? Yes, I was really... That show was something else. It was, it was called Black Friday. I'd shot it entirely in the malls in Doha, like five different malls. We had an amazing production team on, on the ground in Doha. 
that I was working with, who now are the film house, um, they got us access to Villaggio, for example, at 4 a.m. and going there with my father and brother, like, at, you know, before Fajr prayer. And it really was like this sort of fantasy that I have, and I think a lot of people have, of being in the mall when no one is there. And then having that shown in the United States, which, of course, is like the sort of progenitor of the modern mall concept and format. I had been reading a lot about Victor Gruen, the architect of the original sort of format and scripted environment of the shopping mall. Having that film there, which was, I mean, it was like vertical, tall, it had a sort of um, portal-like feel to it. And then against the wall, there was this hill of sand and broken safety glass and 115 tiny videos all playing at the same time, sort of overload. And so it was incredibly ambitious, incredibly difficult to <laughs> actually make the work that had like, the, the work on the ground was called the litany. And all of those videos were playing on broken mobile phones and old iPads and sort of recycling disused and lesser loved technology. And I think that's a running theme through a lot of my work is like the unloved or the uncared for or the... Um, garbage which isn't seen as valuable and then like putting that in the front and putting it in a museum. Hassan Sharif was a huge inspiration for me when I met him. I was lucky enough to meet him when I was working at Matef and the way that he worked with things that he found on the shore in the Emirates or um, you know sandals or bits of like string was uh, I had like galaxy brain when I when I first saw his work. And so that I'm really proud of that show still. And I don't think that it's been um, installed in the same way since. Yeah, it, I really like that. And I felt like it, this was a completely new body of work that you have done. And um, I really like how it was installed at the Whitney. But you speak about the importance of keeping the language of the participants in your exhibition. And obviously, we live in a multi-diverse community, multilingual People speak and think and write in different languages. How do you think the language that we speak in or think and write in can affect how we communicate and express our dreams? If we go back to your uh, Invisible Labor Daydream Therapy exhibition at Metaf. Oh my God, so happy you asked this question. It's on my mind all the time these days. Um, obviously, we're speaking in English. I speak in English as it's my mother's tongue, but... Um, it's something that I think a lot about and, have, and I'm writing about right now is the question of language, especially with Arabic. And the reason that I wanted to keep all of the languages of the participants in the show, it's in, I think, five different languages, the daydream therapy workshops um, you can hear when you walk through. And I know because I've done interviews Bil Arabi in, in Arabic, and it, I'm a multidimensional person, everybody is, and language is in many ways a, it can be, it can feel like a trap when there isn't a sort of, I guess, quote unquote, mastery of it, or there are insecurities around it, or even emotional blocks. And so I really wanted to, for the daydream therapy workshops, for each of the participants to feel fully able to communicate and fully able to express themselves. If somebody had asked me and said they wanted to, you know, do it in a non-verbal, like sort of in bird language, I would have been excited and happy for that. If someone expressed themselves best in like drumming, that would have been fine. But everybody chose their mother tongues, which was interesting. And so I, while I don't I'm unable to understand the Spanish or the uh, Bangladeshi or the... It's still something that I'm glad is present. No, it's really... I mean, I think it's so fascinating how many languages are spoken in Qatar. I mean, we mm -hmm. just launched the Flag Plaza. I don't know if you had a chance to visit. It's, um, it was designed by James Corner and then we had the commission benches by Nejla Zain and it's big community space and I, I like to go there and you know you see people from different countries everyone looking for their flag hugging their flag 
um, performances run by embassies and it's it's been a real success. So I know that you interviewed your uncle back in 2007 and you include that in the exhibition about his dreams mm. and the importance uh, it is to listen to people's dreams and aspirations. And I think I always say, you know, it doesn't matter how intelligent somebody is or how many degrees he has. I think the most important thing is for someone to pursue their passion and what they really want to do because that's the difference um, I find in performance when people are passionate about what they do and what they believe in. So wh why did you interview your uncle first? And second, what are your own dreams? I interviewed my uncle Saleh in 2007, in part because I had a new camera and I really wanted to try it out. And he very sweetly was always very happy to be on camera and to chat. He's actually the person who I credit with teaching me the most Arabic because he do, he doesn't speak English at all. To this day, like I'm not really sure why I asked him about his dreams, but I'm so glad I did because that is the other origins of the title of the show. And it's so sweet to look back on that video because he says, I, I want a Lexus 2008. I want to be out of debt. I want my daughters to go to school, to be a doctor and a social worker. And... He wanted a nice home and all of these things that I think are very simple and pretty universal dreams. Um, and not all of the dreams came true. There are some dreams that he didn't even know that he had that have come true. He's a huge pigeon fancier. And he also has um, discovered a, a passion for horticulture and for growing fruit trees in his courtyard. And wow, he has a green thumb. Who would know this like Bedou boy was like actually really good at growing plants. <laughs> so that was a really special period also for me when I came back to work in Mataf and I was spending a lot of time with my family. And I think my dreams are hinged to my family also. But in, essentially I want the same things that he wants for my loved ones to have opportunities that I had for a secure home, a beautiful home and world peace <laughs> no i think that's um that's uh, you know that's a nice way to come to the end of our conversation because i've read the text that you prepared for the exhibition and i need to go back to watch the videos because you have so many videos that require time mm. but i really felt that you gave a human side of the people that we depend on so many things in our lives um and you know like the like describing sleep as being luxury for the grueling shifts for nurses and hospitals, especially as we consider that we're getting out of a pandemic and mm -hmm. we depended solely on nurses and doctors and hospitals mm -hmm. and the importance of self-reflection on those around us, those giving us a service and being appreciative and compassionate to the work that's been done in developing various infrastructures in the country, but also um, teachers and every profession, I mean, there's a sense of gratitude that one has to express and everybody's, I think everyone who succeeds in his or her journey of life have people that have come their way that they need to express gratitude towards. Is that what you're trying to express or were you just trying to show different human stories? Gratitude is this is the most central thing for me within the within that show each of the people who were interviewed or who did the workshops i i won't say chose but each of the participants in the workshop became involved because i felt tremendous gratitude for something within our encounter they had to be strangers apart from Haris, who works in the museum and that encounter was very chance and was very surprising for me when I saw that he still worked there. But one of the people involved was a nurse at the Cuban hospital in Doha, or outside of Doha, actually. And I met her um, when she was very kind to me in, when I had a medical situation. And, um, and it was through her, her kindness and care that I wanted to... Um, involve her in this because an important part of the work is also that it is sort of a mutual aid project in that each of the people involved um, were paid for their time and should the work sell then they also get the, my portion of the work of the sale 
and um, certainly is something that feels really important to me is like the circulation of support because as a Qatari artist I do feel very supported and I really felt like it would be almost uh, ungrateful and also uh, wrong for me to make a show in Doha that wasn't somehow giving back to the various people that I cross paths with. Thank you, Sophia. This brings us to the end of our conversation today. And, and I, I look forward to um, working with you in the near future. So thank you. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.